Hello, and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone Podcast. I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of exponential technologies, business innovation, entrepreneurship, thought leadership, enterprise IT security, neuroscience, philosophy, personal development, and more. Welcome to the show. did a new branded SharePoint. We didn't even call it SharePoint. We got its own name and it looked nice. So we, on the day we launched it, we did a scavenger hunt, right? For the organization. So by the time you got done with the scavenger hunt, you would have used all the features, right? So it was a, it was an orientation, but because we're a really commercial organization, there was also a prize, right? And so we inferred that, you know, whoever finished first got a nice, so we, we, we pushed all the competitive buttons. There's a team of guys here. Then it was all guys. There's seven people who manage the relationships with all the petrochemical companies, our suppliers, right? BASF and Exxon. And they get that job because they all have really kind of crazy backgrounds. Like maybe somebody worked in the oil industry. Someone was a lot, some one guy's like a brilliant mathematician, beautiful mind trader. So they're all really powerful people. And they're like the varsity football team. They only hang out with each other. They go to lunch together every day. It's on the company dime. There's no, you just do, they are not people you waste their time. <laughs> and it just so happened that our scavenger hunt email went to them and I was mortified because it was like four months in. <laughs> I went down this hall and one of the guys says, hey, Neil, come in here. And I thought, oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> I go in there and he's like, close the door. So now it's going to get even worse. And uh, he's got his whiteboards covered with all these trading formulas and rail cars he's bought. His desk is one, the whole L shape of his desk is just papers. And uh, he's like, uh, come over here. And from underneath the papers that is clearly hidden, he pulls out the scavenger hunt form. <laughs> and he can't find one of the answers, and he wants me to help him, but he doesn't want his peers to know that he's playing the game <laughs> because, you know, they have to be super serious, very serious, you know, big, big shots. <laughs> and that was such an insightful moment that everybody wants – to have fun. Everybody wants to have a laugh. Everybody wants to be goofy. Everybody wants to engage in be a big kid, right? And I think if you can trigger that with a lot of the design stuff, like check out this new screen, right? Uh, it works. People get excited and they're willing to spend time and engage in conversations. And I, I, you can't overstate that. It works every time. If you show me a plain old application with a boring UI versus somebody who spent time making a good looking screen, totally different adoption rate. So, so you took you took your SharePoint and made it into a game, basically. Is that what, is that what you did? You kind of gamified the launch of it? Well, yeah, we gamified the launch of it. And instead of a training class... We did a scavenger hunt. Oh. So if you were interested, you went and did, by the time you did all the scavenger hunt, you had used all that. You did the employee directory search and you found the document in the document library and you did all that stuff. Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Bill Murphy, your host of the Red Zone podcast. Today, I have this amazing interview that I want to share with you. And it's with Neil Goodrich, who's the CIO of the M. Holland Company. Neil and I talk about the concept of human relationships trumping everything. And what we mean by this is that as you're looking at innovation and transformation, how do you get your IT team to engage with the business at, at a higher level, at a level in which they have the confidence and they have the belief in themselves that they can actually use their native God-given problem-solving capabilities to solve problems for the business and to do it confidently and to do it in a practical way. So Neil has created some amazing ways he does this through through storytelling and developing empathy within the business. He's also right down at the at the troops ground level. He's trained his team how to do practical things like before they installed and took on a CRM project, they drove along with the salespeople. They actually took a ride alongs and found what the pain of a salesman was experiencing in the field when a prospective customer or a customer asked questions, but they didn't have the answers. They said, oh, I'll have to get back to you later about that. And the problem was because 
there was systems, four systems that needed to be tied together. And, but they really, the IT team got to appreciate what is actually happening in the field. So I've often said this in my CI innovation lunches is get out in the field with your proof of concepts, like really get into whether it's UX design or whether it's putting something on a tablet or whether it's a new product, like really go with the teams out in the field and see what they're seeing. The tech part of it is the table stakes. It's really, and and Neil talks about that, and it's how your teams are building products and building respect for that end user experience so that they can be in a position to, to help the business win. And so Neil actually talks about what he had to do in the beginning because he had to come in with a culture shift. He came in with these really great ideas, but the business had some legacy momentum from previous leadership. So how do you shift that? over a period of time so that now five years in, he's got some equity within the business. His team has a lot more momentum around it from this culture shift that he's brought about within the organization. And he calls it observational learning. Uh, We could call it design thinking. We could call it whatever we want, but I do believe that these are the higher level skills that a CIO knows. Sometimes the buzzword is EQ, empathy, all of these fancy words. But at the end of the day, I think you'll enjoy listening to some really practical ideas that that Neil and I talk about that Neil executes on with his team as you so as you develop your vision of what you want and how you want innovation and transformation to happen within your organization. I think this is going to be one of the pieces of the puzzle that you're going to find very useful. So with that I want to turn you over to listening to my conversation with Neil, who is the CIO of M. Holland Company. Thank you. Well, uh, Neil, I want to welcome you to the show today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So I was doing some a uh, little bit of checking on some of the stories and some of the interesting things that you've brought to your organization. And I maybe before we get started, I, one of the big things about this show is, is innovation and creativity and how do we get digital leaders to kind of break out, I often say, well, everybody was always through the years, I've been doing this for you know over 20 years, and everybody's wanted a seat at the table. But then once they're at the table, what are we going to say? And <laughs> I was really, it was really interesting to read about you and how you sort of prime your whole team for that. And uh, I'd love for you if, if you could just start us off by just maybe telling you um, a little bit of a story or maybe a little bit about your philosophy about how you feel IT can add value to the business. So I don't come from a technical background. So to me, I came from a problem-solving background. And so by the time I got into technology, that was sort of just one tool in the toolbox. And so that has sort of informed when we talk about building a team or, or looking for new team members or, you know, we played this game when I came to M. Holland with the existing team and we talked about, we had these little forms we filled out uh, and it said, you know, my job is, and we let everybody sort of fill that out. And it, it was very informative about how people perceived what their role was. And at the end of that, we talked about really one of everybody's jobs is to be a student and to be an expert is to be a guide, right? I mean, everybody has people in their lives who look to them for guidance about what computer should I buy, right? That's the curse of being in technology, right? Your neighbor is your uncle. And so, you know, I think a technology team has a chance to be real leaders regardless of the role, right? I mean, uh, one of the things we always talk about is, you know, when the CFO shows up at an accounting clerk's desk, he's there generally to give direction. When the CFO shows up at the help desk, he's literally at the mercy of whoever's there, right? That's a person saying, oh my gosh, I can't get this thing to work. Can you help me, right? And there's an opportunity there to really be more than a service provider, right? To be engaging, to be comfortable with that conversation and to spark what would otherwise be a non-existent relationship. And what does that do for the team if they have these unusual relationships spread throughout the organization? It means they're they're more connected to what's happening in the business. It means they have access, they hear ideas, they have you know people to talk to. And so I think that idea that regardless of your role, there's no sort of entry-level roles. Everybody's jobs are just different and that everyone should sort of be a 
an autonomous agent, they should be comfortable playing that role. And I, I think that's been, it certainly um, informed how we moved forward and picked new team members, right? That, that idea, uh, we actually moved from a double interview format to an in-office interview. And then the second interview is lunch. It used to be with the entire team. We've gotten too big for that. But we intentionally take people to lunch with an intimidating number of people, right? Six, seven, eight, nine people to see what are they going to do in that circumstance? Because there's lots of choices. There's lots of strategies, right? And so that's become part of what we assess when we look at new team members. Interesting. So as in reading some of the interviews you've done, is, uh, which I found really interesting, is the baseline of creativity would it seemed to be confidence in that you were trying to not only build confidence within the team, but it sounds like even before people, when you're taking on new team members, you're looking for some of that from that unique interview approach. Yeah. I mean, I think the ability to interface with other human beings is going to pay dividends regardless of your role, right? And I think so. If you hold that, that's a fact. You got technical skills, which are table stakes, right, in lots of ways. The ability to connect with other people and listen or hear opportunities or empathize or all those things advance the ball. And then the other part of that is you know, if, if you take a creative software developer and a non-creative software developer and you say, can you write me a customization to achieve this thing, right? The interplay with that creative person, right? They're going to get engaged with their creative mind and say, oh, I see what you're trying to do. What if we did it like this instead? Ooh, or what if we added this extra thing you didn't think about? And, you know, and so you start riffing off one another, right? Like a band or anything else that is in that sort of collaborative iterative space, right? So much of the software side of technology is sort of ideation and you, it starts with this fuzzy idea and you, you sort of build, right? And test and try it and you monkey with it. And so I think a creative person is inherently going to produce results. And here there's a direct line to me, you know, if you're troubleshooting a network problem and you have creativity skills, right? You're, it's going to be a more effective, right? You're going to find that unusual problem. You're not going to be stuck in the, now what do I do mode, right? And I think those skills go hand in hand with the kinds of people we look for who go out into the organization and build their own networks of relationships that don't necessarily re relate to their jobs. And because they have those unusual relationships, they learn about the business and are able to surface ideas that no one is bringing to us as technical issues. But we show up and say, oh my gosh, you know that thing that you take for granted is just a really painful fact of life? Look, we could do this and eliminate it. And we're showing up with ideas for issues that haven't been presented to us. And that is a function of the robustness of that social network. Are you trying to train a lot of your guys to be a business analyst in the sense that they're really, or more of like just relationship driven folks that are just like, how do you codify it? Yeah. So I had a, I accidentally in the last year of my MBA program, I took a class called business improvement. And when I got there within the first 15 minutes of class, I realized that that had not been a typo that it had said business improv. And it turned out to be an experimental class where they merged improv skills with business setting. And so you would show up for a class and the teacher would say, okay, 30 minutes, it's a cocktail party. I want you to take a compliment, give a compliment and move on, talk to at least five people. And so the idea that you got a chance to practice those really awkward skills in sort of a safe place had a profound effect on me. And that's really what I wanted to bring to the folks here, right? So just good sort of social skills, small talk skills, the ability to think on your feet, to be comfortable, to be confident. And I think if you do those things, right, lots of other stuff just falls out. I, you know, we don't necessarily need everybody to be a business analyst, but if you're talking to someone, because you went to lunch with somebody that you don't ever work with, right? And then you guys get talking about something in that person's area. And as a technology person, you're aware of something out there in the marketplace that could help with that. All of a sudden, right, just by having that relationship, you're able to put ideas on the table. And that's been something that's been transformational to our reputation here. So I think a lot of IT organizations are stuck being order takers, right? So the organization says, we want to do these things. 
And then the IT organization says, yeah, okay, here we go. And we have this really cool thing at the end of the year. It's sort of like a dim sum, right? So the organization says, we want to achieve these seven or eight things. We serve up a menu of potential ideas. The organization and we pick a couple of those things. You know, we, we look at where the organization is going and we think these are all really good ideas. And so the plan for the following year is always a marriage of those two columns. And I think you wouldn't have that if you don't have sort of eyes and ears and friends sort of all over the organization and no one person can do that. That takes a sort of a fabric. And so that's why we encourage everybody to go, go just make friends in the organization. There's no agenda there. It's just good stuff's going to happen. It seems like you've taught almost you have that. Uh, do you teach that? It sounds like you learned it in that environment at the MBA. How do you instill that across your team? So I think the first generation of folks that were here when I came five, almost six years ago was probably the the strangest thing, right? Because you had to transform people that were already here and and were my predecessor had a very much more traditional sort of approach. And so the idea that you say, you know, we don't need to look at uptime because my assumption is uptime is good unless we're talking about it. And if we're talking about it, then it's bad. So let's talk about something that moves the needle instead, right? That whole modern, right, bring value. What are we doing to bring value? And so we did a lot of workshops and talking and exercises like, what is your job? Well, your job is actually to be a student. Your job is actually to be a leader, right? Now we have enough of a cultural momentum that's self-perpetuating. So when we interview new team members, I don't necessarily have to be in the room, right? Uh, If you take two project managers we have here and you put them in a room, they're going to describe their experiences to that candidate in a way that represents how we operate and how we think about stuff. And they do that through storytelling and, you know, asking questions about like, what would you do in this situation? And the group sort of knows the right answer, like any kind of culture exercise, right? Whether you're talking about organizational culture or team culture, right? When it gets enough momentum, it's sort of socially codified and then it's sort of self-enforcing. So it sounds like you had almost two parts to it. One was the initial when you when you landed, how do you essentially shift a culture that you inherited? And then there was a, probably an inflection point where then the team sort of has its own DNA and its own nucleus about what it means to them. And it seems like that is the approach you're using now. Yeah, absolutely. That makes it sound so nice. It's funny, you know, um, when you're describing stuff like that to other people, it always sounds so nice and tidy, but I can't tell you how many times as the number of people get bigger, the ability to get consensus about a candidate decreases, right? Someone always finds something they don't like. And so what used to be 100% consensus when there were seven people on a team, right? We don't hire anybody unless everybody's on board. Now at 12 or 13 or 14, that's no longer viable. And so every time you compromise, you wonder is this the moment that we're altering the culture? Is this the person that's going to alter the culture, right? And so there's this constant reevaluation, which I suppose is how you sort of keep your eye on the ball. But we do a lot of talking about how does it feel right now, right? And so as the group has evolved, our meetings have evolved, we've, we've gone to a once a month, what we call a monthly lunch, the munch. And, you know, we randomly select two team members to host the next one. So even the flavor of those, right, is different. The activities we do, we invariably end up playing some kind of a game, though it takes all kinds of shapes and formats. We do lunch in a game. And I think that's another great way that you get to teach the culture, right? Because it's not just the one person running it every time to showcase this is how we behave. This is, you know, your peers and, and coworkers, consistently doing that regardless of who's up there. You know, one of the interesting story popped in my head. I, I have a, so my managed security services team was, I meet with, meet with everybody in the company uh, for these really quick 10 minute meetings throughout the year, about once a quarter. And they're not HR interviews. They're just, I want to see who people are and just really look under the hood, ask just open questions. It's just no agenda at all. And one of the guys came in and asked me a question. He was on the, on the help desk. And someone had called in on the help desk about a question and he needed to do research, but he wasn't sure how to respond to the person because he thought the person needed an immediate instant answer, but he needed to do a little research to be, to actually get an accurate answer. He needed to 
talk to someone. He needed to do some research, look at the – he needed to do several things. So he, he felt uncomfortable. He thought he wasn't doing a good job without an immediate response. And he wanted to solve the problem. So I gave him my thought. I said, well, I would think you need to just create a gap between yourself and the person saying, I will get back to you within five minutes. I need to do some research. So it gave him some language for for him. to, But it was like a breath of like fresh air to think that he could actually call someone back. He could actually think about it. But I'm curious. That was just my response. What would you do? Like, how would you how do you coach your team, especially early on, to interact with uh, folks that are calling in to interact with the business people? I think it's very similar to that, right? Which is to say, what you, your your goal is to you're going to talk to this person again, right? So the paramount piece, which is sort of funny, this is a, actually an organizational value that comes all the way down. So when we interact with the outside world, we're representing them Holland and Ed Holland, who's the president and the CEO, and takes that very seriously. And so. If the intent at the help desk is the person that's talking to you right now is probably going to talk to you at the Christmas party or next week, how do we establish a level of credibility and trust there? And I think it's through communication, right? So in your shoes, I give not dissimilar advice, which would be, hey, I think it's this. Can you give me five minutes? I'll call you right back. And then you have to call that person back. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. You have to do whatever it is you said you were going to do because that's where stuff falls off the truck, right? That's the quintessential, terrible help desk experience. I'll call you back. And then, right, there's no call back, whether you're talking about Comcast or AT&T or any of those. So I think it's about honoring the relationship. And when you make a commitment to somebody, you gotta gotta own up to it and be clear about, you know, I don't know the answer right now, but I'm gonna go find the answer and we'll figure it out. Yeah, I love that. And so I I think what struck me is that you're transforming your people into being really powerful business consultants in some respects. It seems uh, to me you've made quite a shift. And I guess why I'm making that statement is that I run an innovation uh, insider lunch series that's in the Washington, D.C. and North Carolina area. And I've said to people in the past, I said, you should go out with your salespeople. You should really have your team go out with your salespeople. And this is, and, and it was really interesting to read about your story about that. And I was wondering if you could share that with my audience about how you taught your team to really get deeply involved with the business that way. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think if I had life to do all over again, I would have ended up with one of those user experience degrees, the like a human computer interaction degrees, because I think I, <laughs> I'm extremely passionate about the observational learning stuff, right? And so when I came into the organization, they wanted to implement a CRM, and CRMs can do right uh, tons and tons and tons of different things in different ways and different features. And so the way I had to get oriented was to go do those ride-alongs with account managers, and everyone here really didn't know what to make of that, including the account managers. And today, right, that observational learning piece, to, to don't draw it on the whiteboard, get out, watch, observe. And today that's transcended not only the tool that that gave birth to, long, but that's just become the way we do things, right? The executive leadership team, when we talk about adding features to the customer platform, they'll say, you know, who did we talk to? What was the UX research like? How did we do? And so that's become something that was at one point alien. Now that's sort of accepted as part of good product building, right? Which is, you can't trust what you think is the right answer. You could take a swag at it, but you should probably have a conversation to begin with. And then that process of sort of, again, it's collaborative, creative engagement, right? Hey, what do you think about this? Oh, it'd be cool if we move the button over here. Oh yeah, that is really cool. What about, right? And so the idea that you get people excited, everybody wants, in my experience, right? Everybody wants to be part of the cool thing. They want to have a tool that looks cool and it's sort of, not appropriate to say that in the work setting we're grown ups and everyone's very serious and right but i think uh if you make a tool or you make a process where people get to create you know a lot of people are stuck in their regular everyday on rails job and the idea that you could say hey come over here help us imagine what this customer platform could be like that's in something that our organization is it's firmly entrenched now that observational learning the ux research the go out and talk to the the people who are really going to 
use the product. And I think if you pull the camera way back, that comes down to sort of design thinking and human centered design, right? Which came out of products, but is directly applicable, I think, a lot in the software space. Oh, I mean, 100% and that empathy building. And what's really interesting also is I think what you've done is you've taken essentially a really strong right brain oriented team by just kind of natural DNA, more technically oriented. And instead of trying to force them through kind of an academic approach, you're essentially exposing them to the real experience of, of being in a uh, real life setting and seeing the issues. And then they can sit back and learn experientially that way versus kind of an academic PowerPoint presentation. They can see, oh, the customer asked three or four questions that the account manager couldn't get an answer to. So that automatically puts their brain into problem solving mode, which is their strength anyway. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, you're, you're right on the money. I think the other piece I come full circle back to the human sort of relationship piece because my predecessor, I think, didn't have a lot of respect for the guys doing sales jobs, right? Because they tend to not be procedurally focused and they don't adapt well and they, you know, they don't read all their email, like all those questions, all those things that, you know, you complain about or you look at as elements of sales teams. But the idea, I, I remember early on in the ride along, one of the account managers looked at me and said, oh man, you have a crazy job. I could never do your job. Terrifies me. I would never do your job. And I, was, and I, I looked at him and I was like, if I had your job, I would throw up in a bucket every morning. The level of risk and uncertainty and rejection that you have to potentially deal with at any moment during the day. And I think that underpinning where you fundamentally empathize and respect the other person's experience, their shoes, you can be frustrated with, you know, behavior stuff, but ultimately, do you really care about what's happening to the other person? If the answer isn't yes, you're not going to make good stuff. If you don't really care about the other person, there's no way that you could extend beyond the bullet point of a feature, right? To really think about what is that person doing right now? Or how could I make that better? And that comes down to empathy. And that comes down to about being able to build relationships and being curious and being interested in other people. You mentioned design thinking and uh, with this human centered approach, did you have any particular mentors in this area after during your MBA program or after that you sort of latched on to as a part of a part of more iterative learning or is it something that just came kind of naturally for you? I have been sort of upside down where like at some point it was definitely not trendy to do those observational learnings. And I definitely at that point in my career got a lot of weird looks at the organization where I was and they, I didn't have the right vocabulary to express the value of that. And, and it wasn't a topic that had a label at that point. And so I sort of found it as a way to explain the thing that I had always felt. And then obviously I went on to read a bunch of stuff so that I wasn't misusing the term. But I, it was really born out of the way I operated. And then I was relieved to find a whole community that had already done all the work of like methodology and naming. And so I was able to connect with other people by finding the right verbiage, right? Was there a book that people could turn to or a group online that you found that you can remember or that was useful for you in, during this process as, if, as you developed kind of a language and a vocabulary around it? Oh, uh, man, I feel like I'm failing your listeners. I was fortunate to see some speakers, and now that's all sort of blended away into the education process. But a speaker here, a speaker there, an article connecting the dots. I had some mentors, right? But I, I can't really point to a thing. It was more about reading enough and seeing enough from enough varied sources that it, it sort of all came together for me. And I was able to put that together with the thoughts that were already in my head. Yeah, there's definitely plenty of material out there for you know listeners. I, I think you've, you've done it very organically. Yeah, and I feel bad that I can't you know, point to that trail for someone else. But I think there's plenty to know, though. I mean, for example, I'm, I'm involved with Singularity University, and, I, and there's a whole design thinking staff that has published books. There's, you know, Eric Reese. There's just there's a there's a quite a bit of design thinking approach to building empathy. And, and um, but I still feel that, you know, the CIO just needs to they don't know if they necessarily know how to deploy that in a real practical way. And what I really enjoy about talking with you is that 
you've actually made it very, very practical where you can execute on it with your team. Is you had to fix it first. There was like two steps. Like yeah. it was never easy. You just don't. You can't just walk in and launch into the ideas. You actually kind of took it step by step and had some. You know, you had to kind of reconstitute your team early on and. It made it very practical. I mean, going on a ride along for one person is one thing, but then you scaling that into your team and developing relationships, that's a whole different level. You know, if you really think about prototyping, right, where everyone says, like, listen, you got to do a mock up, you got to do a prototype, people have to see it. That's the same thing with anything, right? For me, because I came to the technology concepts as sort of an outsider, right, I had to learn those things. I learned doing and watching, right? I, I learned practicality first. And so I think I had a little bit of an advantage because the way I think is more pragmatic. Like, how are we going to really do this? And I think that's a lot realer for, I think I just made that word up. That's a lot more real for people, right? On a team, when you're explaining something, if you're on a PowerPoint slide and you're you're explaining this sort of big picture, cloud, hand wavy thing. And they're like, yeah, I, I want to participate, but I don't get it. I don't know how. And so I think our, we've had the advantage that we sort of do first. And then the organization will say, wow, we really like that. And then we're able to say, well, this is what we did. And so for us, the sort of articulating that into a methodology or philosophy has come behind the actual sort of piloting of the thing, whatever that was. Was it UX research? When we stood up the project management office, we hired a project manager for a year, and the person just helped other people run their projects. Rather than try to explain what does a PMO do, we put a project manager in play, and then we got feedback from all those people whose projects had been impacted, and the organization said, yeah, that really made a difference. And you're like, great, that's what a PMO does. And then now we have a PMO. And I think it's about the same concept you use in software development when you talk about organizational change, right? Find something that's real, do a prototype, show the value, and then people get excited. And once they're excited and they're engaged, then you don't have to try to explain the theory about this thing, right? And then it all sort of makes sense to them. And now that has worked for me, right? I run into trouble on the other side when people say, well, can you explain to me big picture, right? Because that comes last to me. That's not how my brain is wired. And so I've had to do a lot of work on the flip side of that, which is sort of writing those high level depictions of things is something that I have to work on as opposed to figuring out the way to implement it. I see. So, but as far as the big picture, do you mean like a roadmap, like a, like a, the bigger organization, kind of uh, the trajectory and arc of how you're guiding IT to support the business? Is that what you mean by big picture or more or different than that? No, I inherently find myself drawn to explaining how we're going to do it and not all audiences, right? When you think about talking to the executive level of an organization, right? They're looking for the thing that I shy away from because most practitioners, right, that up in the clouds view, right, where there's not a lot of how, but there's a lot of vision and there's a lot of um, sort of the details fall away. And because of my background, having been a practitioner for so long and coming up and learning that stuff and doing it as a way to implement it and bring change, I have a hard time letting go of the details, right? And just talking in concepts. So I invariably end up doing a lot of storytelling. So I've supplemented that in different ways, right? So that piece, the big picture, the low detail, the sort of directionally correct, I always feel... Like, why would anyone want to listen to this? There's no meat. There's no meat here, right? But it's exactly what that audience wants. So I have to fight my nature sometimes when I do those presentations. Yeah, and it sounds like though that you have a lot of the grounding, which as you develop that kind of higher level uh, storytelling and that vision at the board and the and the upper level, it sounds like yours will be grounded in some real uh, functional reality, which it, I think is always going to be refreshing because of the there's a transparency you're getting from your team because you sort of have a lot of bird dogs out there looking for dead bodies. They're looking for opportunities. They're looking for pieces to help change the business, which uh, gives you, I think, a different uh, perspective on the vision when that when that does come together for you. Yeah, I think that's the only way I could ever be comfortable in that high level role, right? Which is I can't I can't imagine a place where you become so disconnected from the 
products and the how and the, like that would be a real bummer for me. I'm not sure that I would want to have a role that was totally separated from that. And I think there's, I don't know that that's everybody's preference, but that's definitely my preference. I would never want to, you know, the stuff we make here as digital products and the expressions really the idea that someone comes and says, hey, I have this really cool idea, and then three months later or 75 days later, they're using this tool or the screen or the form, the emotion, right, when they're amped that this thing didn't go into a black hole, that it's, you know, the idea to make those people's ideas real and change the business is sort of what gets me up in the morning. And I, to be divorced from that, right, I would never want to be so far away I couldn't see that. Well, I think that's interesting as we talk about leadership quite a bit and, you know, it's it's like how do you be a leader and not have the appreciation for the kind of the what's really happening and the feeling and the experience of the end, end customer internally and the customer externally. I'm always drawn to the uh, book that was written about Abraham Lincoln. I think it's called Team of Rivals. And I, I love, I think Doris, I forget their last name, the author. But, uh, you know, Lincoln went down into the front lines many times. And just to get a heartbeat of he just wasn't, you know, sure himself and uh, especially when he's trying to figure out how to turn the tide of the of the war. So I find it I always remember that even some of the most respected leaders of all time actually went and had a firm grounding in the reality of, of what was happening. And I thought that's it's interesting. Your your method reminds me of quite a bit of that. I think that's not dissimilar from yours, right? You said you had 10 minute meetings with everybody sort of, you know, throughout the year. I, I, I think that's a huge, not only is that a huge connector, it, I think it has a disproportionate impact on the other person's relationship, right? The idea that you are interested enough and genuine enough to sit down and have those conversations, right? Yes, you get value from that from an understanding perspective, but the idea that all those people, that's a culture touch, that's a, right, that has, that's so powerful. Yeah, I think when you learn, it's funny because if you can convey, I learned it from someone who was obsessed. Oh, it was someone I listened to on a, uh, I think it was maybe even Gary Vaynerchuk. You know, he has a 200 person, you know, the, it's just a silly amount of people. I mean, no, it's 800 people, 900 people, just a crazy amount of people. And his goal was to meet with everybody for 10 minutes. And, he wanted. He was obsessed with finding a way to scale his relationships, and nobody wants to talk about the human impact of being a leader. But if you can understand who someone is, uh, I found it really quite interesting because I find out like who's a black belt, you know, who's doing sword fighting competitions, you know, who's, and all of a sudden you're like, gosh, that's really, I got a really interesting group of people. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, really, much more interesting than I thought. And then when you're out there in the field with the sales guys. You can say, you know, I just want you to know who you're going to be calling in the help desk. You're going to be calling like a, a black belt. And, you know, and it's it's quite, it's interesting because I never would have made that connection otherwise. But I think that's what we're talking about. This whole conversation has been about, right? Like the idea that you appreciate the person, that you're curious, that you're engaged, that that, that interest transcends the transactional nature of your role, right? And I think that's the thing that we try to inspire and, and recruit for. Right, you can't train someone to be interested in other people, <laughs> and I think we're fortunate. So the guy at the end of the hall here, for me, Ed Holland, every Christmas time he goes away for two weeks with his family. But before he does that, he literally walks down the hall and does exactly what you what you're doing. He stops and he visits every single cube and every single office for a couple of minutes and just chit chats about you know nothing in particular, no agenda, and. It's just sort of this thing that, like, you just, it's not, it doesn't happen in a lot of places that the CEO wanders around and sort of like makes a day of just connecting with people. You know, it's interesting. We talked a little bit about innovation. Um, I don't know if this is true. I can't prove it empirically. I'm not even sure I ever will, ever will try. But someone said that the relationship building within the organization actually builds speed. And I thought that's a really interesting thing. Oh, yeah. You know, it builds the ability to be more mobile more adaptive. That's a belief of mine. I have zero evidence for that, but what do you think? No, no. I think there's a book called, um, was it The Speed of Trust? Oh, interesting. 
I think you're in the clear. I don't think you have to prove it. I think somebody else has done the math. You're good. You can just point and be like, yeah, I knew that. I, 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 I was on board with that. Yeah, I mean, I think about, right, if you think about any kind of project you've ever been on where the person says they're going to do it and you're like, well, I know their track record. And then you spend a lot of time babysitting them, right, to make sure that they deliver versus the person you know is always or you have that good relationship or you can like if you have a good relationship you could text that other person be like hey you're gonna get your thing done tomorrow right and that level like that just changes the way that you can communicate it changes the options it changes the robustness of the conversation and if you have a relationship that other person doesn't want to let you down Right. So I just think that the power of the relationship is so multifaceted for so many of the Today's competitive advantage is about all the products are commoditized, all the services are commoditized. What's not commoditized? Why should your organization not ship your entire IT services out somewhere? What can you do? What is the value? And the value is the human piece. The value is the idea finding, the brainstorming, the ideation, the let me help you get this over the finish line, all those sort of non-standard technology pieces. The technology skills have become commoditized, right? Those are table stakes. Yeah, you got to have those. But I think, how do you make digital or technology a, a, a competitive advantage and all that's buried in the human skills? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, this is a, this is a powerful conversation. I, I, uh, I'm really looking forward to my audience listening to it because it's, it's taken on a very uh, grounded, real approach to leadership, which I believe is inextricably linked to innovation and transformation and and uh, and speed, which is really the human being. Because it's interesting, you know, we're going through a lot of changes, of course, digitally. And I just shared this on another show, but you know, the the, the horse drawn carriages, the people that own the the buggies and own the horses, were seriously probably pissed that the car was invented. But they had to kind of tr- they had to transform, they had to retool. I mean, the guy that was picking up all of the the excrement from the horses walking around New York City, someone said it was just so much garbage. It was like everybody had a job to take care of these horses and the buggies, but it all had to change. And it's funny that as we go along, it's like, what are those skills that are helping people learn and adapt and, and change within organizations and recreating environment, which basically embraces that, embraces the, the learning. And, and, and you've basically hedged your bet. You, you have your troops right down on the edge to kind of sense what's happening with the business almost uh, instantaneously. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to say it was that fast, but I think we have a good feel. So I think we we did that because we're a privately held company. And in much the same way, we don't formally announce stuff. You just start to see behavior surface across the organization. And I'll tell you what's been really cool. What you'll find, like the commercial team and the executive team and us, Everyone will start talking about the same kind of thematic. So, like, we are, we're talking about capacity planning, and other people are talking about getting return on investment and managing whether we're really getting our ROI on the investment. But what happens is the organization sort of comes to these themes together, and I think it's it's been fascinating for me to wonder – you know, how does that happen? And it happens through the social network. It happens because people are talking about, well, I'm really thinking about this. Oh, I'm thinking about that too. Oh, that's sort of like, and the idea that you're able to move the organization, right? When we go into the room to talk about projects or ideas or the roadmap for three years from now, we're not selling anything. We're articulating something that the people in the room generally are already like, yep, yep, totally feel that. That's exactly where my mind was. And so I, think, I feel like part of our success has been we're in an organization that welcomed that, that wanted that from a technology team. Because I think there's probably lots of places where my advice, you know, the organization would say, what are you guys doing? Knock it off. Just go back. I'll call you when the copier is broken. That's what I want from you. So I think uh, you have to be in the right organization, too. I don't think you can magically make your organization want that different kind of technology team. No, no, possibly not. You know, and I think it's incrementally step by step. But if someone has a personal vision, I think, you know, we would talk about this is that to be a leader, you got to have a personal vision first. It just doesn't you can't inherit it from from necessarily from the company. I, yeah. So, you know, you've got to walk in and, and then you had some other experiences before you even got to this organization. So I hope people listen to this and they start to develop their own vision. Yes. Hell yeah. That's what I want to do. And if, yeah. the, if the organization is not right, good. 
I mean, some organization wants that and go find a different spot, but now they sound different. And that's the big thing I, I love about this show and the innovation group I'm in is that we need people to sound differently in their interviews so they don't sound like everybody else. They want to sound, you want to sound like you're actually up for this innovation game. You want to help a business at a big level. And so I think it's just important to hear your message. Yeah. When they interviewed for this role, the organization wanted something different, but they didn't know what it was. And so there was a sort of a magical moment where I wanted to do something different with a technology team that hadn't existed at my last place and they wanted something different. And so we sort of just, we rolled the dice together. And today I think we have a really, the interplay between the business and the technology team I hesitate to even make those two separate things because we're not really right. It's this, it's, we just all seamlessly blend together at this point. We've done a, it's been a really cool marriage. Well, Neil, I, I really appreciate you for your time. I know we're at the top of the hour and I only uh, uh, asked you for an hour, but I, this has uh, been a very, I think, powerful ideas and concepts that you've executed on. And I, um, is there any way that someone, if they had a question for you, could reach out to you and either, Twitter or LinkedIn, uh, if, they, if anybody wanted to ask you a question or two? Yeah, I'm definitely on LinkedIn. My Twitter's out there. It's not very active. I would be afraid their their request would languish for some <laughs> pronounced period of time. I think LinkedIn's probably a for sure way to get a hold of me, for sure. That would be fantastic. Thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Well, cool. Yeah, I, I hope we can do this uh, round two in the future, but uh, I, I've really... Uh, this has been great. I kind of had a gut instinct that this is, uh, you had some really uh, powerful perspectives that uh, I think a lot of people need to hear. So I, I thank you for taking the time with my, um, with my audience. Sure. Thank you. So there you have it. This wraps another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. To get all the relevant show notes, please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, I appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.